Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the last of this year's COVID webinar series where we're joined by three speakers, Vadim Demichev, Pedro Beltro and Padita Baron, who will give us short updates on their work before we enter a roundtable discussion chaired by another returning speaker, Dr. Martin Dens. He previously gave a talk in our COVID series on the development of a diagnostic COVID MRM test, which can be viewed on our YouTube channel. I just have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before handing over to the first of today's speakers. As always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussion, so please join us there to ask questions, share any thoughts and discuss the work. And please use a thumbs up to let us know which questions you'd like to hear answered. It's going to allow the speakers to answer any other questions or follow up after the talks are finished as well. And especially today, as we have multiple speakers and all the Q&A sessions going to be rounded up in the roundtable discussion, please direct your questions by naming the speakers as you type them in. For those of you needing an attendance certificate for this webinar, details will be available on how to get this after the last slide. Um, and we just want to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help with setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group and the London Metabolomics Network um, for their help uh, with promoting this. So first of all, um, we are also going to have today's um, YPIC challenge and uh, that will be handed over to after the uh, discussion. So also today, last of our COVID seminars for this year, for our next general proteomics webinar, it will be on Friday, December the 4th. We'll be looking at the topic of protein protein interactions and have talks from two new speakers and a guest chair to host a roundtable discussion in this field. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the first of today's speakers, and that's Dr. Vadim Demacher from the Francis Crick Institute in London. So Vadim works on high throughput proteomics methods and their applications to large scale screening and disease profiling. The combination of DIA proteomics such as SWATH and scanning SWATH and DIANN, a neural network based automated software suite for data processing, allows the throughput of 180 samples per day in the mass spec while yielding good identification numbers and accurate quantification. Today he will update us on their groups ultra-fast proteomics pipeline for COVID-19 outcome prediction. So it's over to you, Vadim. Vadim, you're muted. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you so much for introduction and Many thanks to organizers for inviting me. I will briefly introduce our ultra-fast proteomics platform first, and then talk about how we use it to profile plasma and serum samples from coronavirus patients, to understand the, the progression of the disease, and eventually to predict the outcome. So, the way we're analyzing the samples, so everything starts with the 96 well based sample preparation and this is four plates in parallel which are processed in a liquid handling robot so it's semi-automated and then it goes into high flow liquid chromatography system which allows us to run five minute gradient proteomics with a throughput of about 180 samples a day on a single instrument so the mass spectrometer it's a sykes triple top 6600 it operates in swath ms mode so da acquisition and the point of using it is because it allows to gain get quite precise quantities and higher robustness of identification with low rate of missing values and then all this is processed in a in-house software which we recently published so when we look specifically at the performance of a workflow on plasma and serum samples we get just over 200 unique proteins identified in a single run and this corresponds to roughly 260, 270 different protein groups. So of course, this is lower proteomic depth than if you compare these to much slower workflows, but uh, the whole thing is highly optimized for quantitative precision. So for example, in quality control samples, repeat injections, we're getting median protein CV values of just over 5%. And if we look at the PCA plot, then uh, what we see is that sample preparation controls they cluster very tightly together which is indicative of the fact that technical variation which they represent is basically negligible in comparison to biological variation which we want to study so in the spring uh, we got access to 
uh, samples, plasma and serum, from the very first patients which were admitted to Charity Hospital in Berlin with coronavirus. And we used this workflow to profile these samples. So it was quite a small cohort, 48 patients at different severity grades. Uh, severity ranging from WHO3, which is patient is hospitalized but no need for extra oxygen support, to WHO7, so all the range. And this means invasive mechanical ventilation and additional organ support, so very severe patients. And we ask a question whether we are able to characterize the phenotype by just looking at the proteomes. So can we identify biomarkers of severity this way? We looked at, uh, so this consists of two different cohorts, one, one plasma and one serum, and we identified 27 proteins differentially expressed in, in each of one of them. And the way I can characterize is that, that primarily this is inflammatory response for proteins like serum amyloid, uh, fibrinogens, uh, coagulation, C-reactive protein. So inflammatory response is, is the main characteristic of how the patient responds to coronavirus disease on the proteome level. Since May, uh, we've been working on a data from a much larger cohort. So it's now 139 different patients, almost in 700 different samples, so corresponding to multiple time points per patient. And this heat map of different proteins in, in different patients is now looks like this. So here are mild patients, here are severe patients, and here are different features measured. And this time, in addition to just proteins, we also had a compendium of clinical information, so over eight over 80 different clinical parameters, clinical lab values measured, and 56 of them are differentially expressed depending on severity of the coronavirus. So the question is, okay, all this is great, so we can be able to characterize the phenotype, but can we predict what's going to happen in the future based on these proteins and clinical values? And this, this is what we investigated next, and now the size of the cohort, it allowed us to do that. So this can be tested in multiple different ways. And we started by looking at mild coronavirus patients, so WHO3, no extra oxygen support. And we tried to predict uh, how, how long they will take to recover based on their proteomes. So as a proxy for this, we're using the number of days in hospital remaining since, since the proteomic sample was taken. And indeed, we're able to do that. So we identify 26 different proteins, which are predictive. So here are some examples. Many of them make sense. So cystatin C, for example, CST3 is, is a kidney marker. Serpin A3, uh, so we have reasons to believe it reflects neutrophil activation in the samples. And uh, NTBNP, it's, it's a cardiac marker. So things make sense. Another way of uh, predicting what's going to happen is by looking at longitudinal information. So because we have multiple time points per patient. And uh, here on the heat map, so we have again different patients stratified by WHO grade. Here are mild patients, WHO 3, 4, here are severe patients. And different features here. And the color here indicates the log fall change during the time in hospital for a particular patient. So if we have a protein in this red here, it means that it, it went up in a particular patient. If it's blue, it means it went down. And the way we can characterize what we're seeing is that it's, it's a general alleviation of proteomic response. So initially, there is a spike in, the, in the different kinds of inflammatory factors, and then they gradually go down. What, what, what was very surprising to us is to see that this response is very similar between mild patients and severe patients. And we can actually quantify this statistically and, and just identify the proteins. There are several proteins which are different, but primarily it's very similar. And uh, we think that this reflects the general alleviation of inflammatory response with time. There is one important exception. Uh, so it's not all proteins which are alleviated. Uh, well, well, examples are CAPC active protein, serum amyloid. You see that they're going down here mostly, but not, not all proteins are. And one exception is organ function markers. 
So many of them are alleviated, many of them are not alleviated. It's very diverse between different patients. So we think that uh, this might be indicative of some lingering organ, organ damage. Now, another question is, uh, is there a difference between, uh, if we look at specifically critical patients, is there a difference between survivors and non-survivors? So here are survivors, here are non-survivors. And in general, it, it looks like uh, the trajectories are very similar. But if, if we do statistical testing, we're able to identify proteins which behave differently. One example is, for example, CAP here. So it, it tends to go up in, in non-survivors, tend, tends to go down in survivors. Another example is serpent A4, so it's calistatin, and it's known to be protective in lung tissue against inflammation and, uh, and apoptosis. So might be, might, might, be, might be worth monitoring proteins like this to see what's going on with the patient, and maybe adjust the therapy based on that. So this, this is, of course, all, all good that we can predict what's going to happen based on the trajectories of particular proteins. But ideally, we would like to be able to look at a single time point, take the proteomic sample, put in the mass spec, measure it, and predict the outcome. And uh, here we teamed up with a group of researchers from London, which previously developed uh, a machine learning approach, a powerful machine learning approach called bronchitic networks. And they applied it to double issue grade seven, so critical patients in our data set. Uh, the basic idea of the approach is uh, it, it basically works for any classification problem, binary classification problem. And the idea is that for each sample, there is a network constructed which connects different proteins together. So nodes correspond to proteins and edges of the network, they are weighted. And the weight corresponds to uh, confidence with which you can classify a particular sample based on a pair of proteins. So edge connects two different proteins together. Networks look like this approximately, and one can calculate different kinds of topological characteristics based on these networks, and then build the classifier using these characteristics. So in a sense, uh, the method uh, is just a very powerful method of supervised dimensionality reduction for machine learning. It seems to perform quite well on this kind of data sets. So here are the results. So first, we use cross-validation to assess performance of the method on our cohort. We call it charity cohort. And we get about uh, 0.8 AUC for receiver operating characteristic for predicting survival. Uh, now, we also tested it in a completely independent cohort. So it was measured on a different match, but on the same instrument. And we actually got, got effectively 100% accuracy of prediction. So uh, probably, probably simply by chance. So the, the real performance, I guess, is somewhere in between these results. And what I would like to note is that the Cherry Tech Ward has median time until outcome 39 days, Innsbruck Ward 22 days. So in both cases, the prediction is done weeks before the outcome. So I think it, it uh, demonstrates the power of the method. So we're able to predict things quite accurately, even uh, four or five weeks be before the eventual outcome. Uh, we don't have full statistical characterization, so just not enough samples to tell what, what kind of, so, so you, see, you can see we get kind of different box plots in one case and another case. But, uh, it does seem like we're able to tell quite confidently that certain patients are very low risk. It's, it's not as, as high confidence when telling that particular patient is high risk. Okay, so uh, I would like to know that uh, the proteomic method was developed in Markus Rauss lab in Francis Crick Institute. Uh, Proteome measurements were carried out in Charité, and uh, he is us, our group. And we've had absolutely fantastic collaboration with a number of clinical groups. So special thanks to Florian and Pincus here, 
and also a very cool collaboration with a team of, from London. So Tatiana and Harry did all the machine learning. So it's been amazing, I think. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vadim. Uh, great talk. And uh, just remember, if you have questions for Vadim, um, please put his name in front of them in the Slack channel because we're going to be addressing all of them at the end. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to our second speaker. So today is Dr. Pedro Beltro from the EBI in Cambridge, and he's been a group leader at Emberley EBI since 2013. Um, and he will update us today on their work on the Comparative Host Coronavirus Protein Interaction Network. So over to you, Pedro. Hi, yeah, thank you for organizing this. Uh, it's going to be quite superficial. I'm just going to give you some updates on the projects that are not for my group, but uh, a large collaboration. So this is from the QBI Coronavirus Research Group, which is, you know, over the course of several projects has now involved over 15 different institutes, institutions, you know, over 200 scientists. And our group has been involved in three particular projects that have been published over the course of the last uh, nine months, more or less. And the whole purpose of these projects has been to try to understand how the virus takes control of the human cells or the target cell, and then to suggest potential drugs that could counteract this. Um, and so there's many components to this work. Our efforts of my group has been more on the competition analysis of, of this. But there's, of course, many other groups that work on structural biology, chemical biology, and cell of infection. And so the first project, uh, as was mentioned, is was this uh, effort to try to map out the protein interaction between the viral proteins and the host proteins. And this was then followed up with a, a project looking at the changes of uh, phosphorylation during the time course of infection. And the most recent project was comparing the protein interactions between the virus and the host for three different uh, coronaviruses. And all of these, of course, rely on mass spectrometry. We ourselves don't do the mass spectrometry. This was the mass spectrometry was all done at UCSF by Nevin Krogan's uh, lab. So as a just brief reminder, again, the first project was taking each of the human proteins, one at, each of the viral proteins one at a time, using a strap tag uh, construct expressed in hex cells uh, individually, and then once purified using mass spectrometry to identify the interacting proteins in the hex cells uh, background. And once this is done, this is scored, there's different approaches of scoring this. You know, there, there's been different efforts as well done by using different methods and they all don't agree. It'll be an interesting discussion maybe towards the end that we can go through, and of course, different ways of scoring these will give you different uh, consequences. But again, the idea is if we can identify these target proteins, maybe we can suggest drugs for these that could be interesting to, to target. And this is what it was done in this first publication. Here's just some examples where N protein pulls down casein kinase 2, which is kinase. And then uh, this particular inhibitor, actually in assays done in, in cell in, in the lab, were shown to have antiviral properties in a cell-based model. And how these experiments are done, this was all the, the experiments uh, were done by Marco Venuzzi's lab in Pasteur and Adolfo Garcia's lab at Mount Sinai. And the way these are typically done is you have some cell lines that can be infected and then you, you have some drug that you test, in this case, like remdesivir as a positive control. And you would hope to see is that there's a decrease in infection as you increase the in concentration of the drug, as, as shown here by this red line, and you don't want to kill the cells. So simply, you want something that will kill, stop the proliferation of the virus, but not stop the, not kill the cell. In this first uh, paper, it was around 69 compounds that were suggested. I think out of those, there's something like uh, 40 something were, were tried. And out of those, a few tens uh, showed promising results in these cell-based models. And of course, remdesivir is also an interesting example to show you that it, it, although it has a very potent effect in a cell-based model, it still does not necessarily translate into the clinic, which is again an important point for discussion. A lot of these uh, molecular biology studies were useful to identify compounds in a cell-based model, but then these need to be followed up in, in organisms uh, and then of course in, in human trials. So the second study that we've done uh, was looking at uh, changes in phosphorylation across the time course of infection. I won't say much about this, but you know the assay was a long 24-hour period, uh, taking samples uh, compared against a mock-controlled infection and doing phosphoprotein abundance, phosphorylation studies and protein abundance using mass spectrometry and along the time course of infections. And so our group has a lot of experience in analyzing phosphoproteomics data. And so we could propose uh, which kinases would be most strongly regulated across the time course of infection. And from here, we could at the same time 
try to understand uh, the infection process, what was happening in the cell during the infection. And of course, more obviously, we could predict which kinases were being regulated. Therefore, we could suggest kinase inhibitors that could be used to target uh, the virus. One of the one of the interesting findings that was that we could see from the fossil proteomics data directly that we could predict that uh, there was a lot of uh, potential regulation of cytoskeleton uh, proteins in either through the kinases or specific uh, regulatory phosphocytes of these proteins. And then we teamed up with the uh, different groups that could look at the, the morphology and there is indeed uh, increase for the podio formation during infection. The, no, the why of this is still not sure, so it could help uh, target nearby cells or it could just be to facilitate the budding of the virus. So finally, the last project that we've been working on uh, was a study of, of different coronaviruses using the same approach. So this is more the direct follow up of the first uh, story. So the idea here is if you have different viruses, uh, in particular from evolutionarily related viruses, they will all diverge in sequence throughout the, this evolutionary process. And this could have different consequences. On one hand, it could lead to changes, for example, in protein localization of these viral proteins, the differences in activity or differences in interactions. And so both of these could potentially lead to differences in how they target the host. And differences or conservation would allow you to say which drugs were more likely to be useful for future coronaviruses of the same clade. And so this could also be helpful to say also drugs that are less likely to cause resistance because those would be harder for the virus to diverge away from. So this is what the study was about. So we had these three viruses. This, this one was published in this uh, first study, Gordon et al. And then we had SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. These are the number of proteins. Again, the same protocol. These are individually expressed trapped tag proteins expressed to hex cells one at a time, purified and then uh, pulled down where it's analyzed through mass spectrometry. So in parallel to this, we had for all three, several of the proteins, most of the proteins tagged, uh, and then immunofluorescence localized inside cells. And for only SARS-CoV-2, we had also a number of antibodies. So we could also do uh, localization studies during the context of infection itself. So we could compare what is the localization of the protein when you have it expressed just one at a time without the infection? And then what happens to the localization of the protein in the presence of the infection during the infection? And finally, for the SARS-CoV-2 interactors, we also had CRISPR and RNAi done. So we could say which of these genes, if you knock them out or knock them down, would have an impact on proliferation. Just some quick take home uh, message from here. So here we're summarizing the localization information. In the bluish colors, you have the localization of the proteins in the absence of infection. So when you express one protein at a time, and if you focus on that first, one of the key take homes from this is if, you, if the same protein exists in the three different viruses, it would almost always localize to the same compartments. And this is in the absence of infection. But this is one key take home message is that typically these proteins across these three viruses don't diverge in terms of their protein localization which is you know, already potentially useful to know. A second take home message, and it is potentially not unexpected, but you know, it's always a cautionary tale, is that the localization of the protein in the context of infection, which is denoted here by these boxes, is potentially different than when you express them one at a time. And, and so there's strong overlaps in some scenarios, but in particular, oftentimes you may have a diffuse heteroplasmatic staining uh, expression in the absence of infection, but then you may have punctite cytoplasmatic stainings that have to do, for example, with the formation of these replication centers or replication factories that this particular viruses can, can induce. And so this is, of course, then a note of caution that some of these interaction studies will not often, not totally relate necessarily to the context of infection. Nevertheless, the important thing is that uh, these are interaction studies that are only done primarily to suggest hypothesis of how the cell biology might be changing and also potentially the drugs. But so we always have to follow these up carefully. So finally, we could directly look at the interactions between the three and suggest which are the most conserved processes and the processes that look least conserved. As you know from aspidromity, looking at differences is always tricky because you may not see a protein. So it's always harder to quantify the difference. If you're interested in that, the paper goes into trying to quantify the difference. So even in the presence of a of an absence of information. And so more than likely, it's easier to say something about what's conserved. Here are such some examples of processes that are conserved, meaning protein interactions are conserved across the three. 
And the other thing that we can look at is for the different baits, for the different viral proteins, which ones have the most conserved interactions. So for example, uh, M, NSP11, NSP7, NSP8 all have a larger proportion of interactions that are common to all three, while some other proteins, uh, for example, NSP6, as is just an example, will have interactions that are, for example, more specific to MERS or, or in particular NSP2, for example. Uh, then we can ask ourselves, why is it that this is the case? And I already told you that this is not to do, for example, with a change in localization. So it must be something else. And so the, the actually the, the most obvious information is, of course, in the sequence. So what you can do is you can compare the sequence between the SARS-2 protein and the other, say, MERS or SARS-1, which is shown here in two different colors. But so what you can obviously see, you can really see is that you can compare the sequence identity between pairs of orthologs and the overlap in their protein interactions. You can see that there's a pretty reasonable correlation between these two. So the, the more sequence similar they are, the most likely they are to show uh, similar interactions. And in a sense, this is somewhat expected, and it almost follows a neutral drift idea that the more you drift away in sequence, the less likely it is that you're going to share interactions. What you can do is, with this is then look off of the diagonals. And so, for example, NSP13 is an example where it, it shares more interactions that you would expect by this level of sequence similarity. Or in particular, R6 as another example would be another example like this. So you can use this trend then to look for things that are off of this diagonal. And so finally, the other thing that we observed in this data is that uh, there were cases where there was a, a lot of shared partners, but not through the same interactions. So the, the different viruses were often interacting with the same processes, but through different viral proteins. An example of this is the nuclear envelope. So there's, uh, this is nuclear envelope proteins are enriched across all the three viruses, but not necessarily by the same interactions. And this is shown here. So. Uh, the different different colors here represent the different uh, shared or not shared interaction partners, and the, these are all always enriched in the three viruses, but oftentimes by different proteins, as as we can show see here by these examples. And so finally, and I'm not going to go into details. Then uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 proteins uh, interactors, there was RNAIs and, and CRISPR screens done, and again, although these are two different approaches, the overlap of these is not fantastic and maybe it's not expected two different cell lines two different technologies uh, but then uh, and again i'm not going to go into details what you can do with this is then uh, for, in particular for cases where there is a shared interactions we can look for cases where the interactors that are shared across the three give a phenotype when you perturb them with rni or crispr and this would be of course very useful targets because these are a lot more likely than to be good targets for future coronaviruses so i'll i'll finish here we can identify these conserved regulated processes. Uh, they're not always by the same interactions. And we, we, we have one particular example where we think there's been a convergent evolution where the protein of MERS is similar to a protein of SARS-2, but they're not the same protein. And sequence variation, but not localization, appear to determine these changes in interactors. And of course, we have this collection now of conserved processes that we think would be useful to target. And with that, I'll finish. Thanks, Pedro. Great talk. Um, just reminding everyone again that if you've got questions for Pedro, please uh, put his name in front of them in the Slack channel so that we can direct them to him at the end in the roundtable discussion. And now I'm going to move on to our final speaker to today, and that's Professor Padita Barron from the University of Manchester. She's an analytical physical chemist with expertise in the development and application of eye mobility mass spectra biological systems. And in 2013, she was appointed chair of mass spectrometry and director of the Michael Barber Collaborative Centre for Mass Spectrometry in Manchester. In response to COVID-19, she set up the COVID-19 MS Coalition, and today she's going to update us with her talk entitled Coordination, Collaboration and COVID-19, the Role of Mass Spectrometry. So over to you, Paddy. We can't hear you, Paddy. Thank 
Hurley, I'll just try stop sharing and then resharing. I don't know why we can't hear you. Just. That's it. We can hear you now. Yeah, now we can hear you. It's all right. Is it, it, does it sound okay though? Or yeah, we can hear you okay. clearly. Clearly. Okay, great. Super. Sorry, everyone. Uh, let me go back. <laughs> One slide. Because I keep talk about you. Can you give me? Oh, control. Yay. Right. Click. Okay. Hi. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I've heard some fantastic science and I'm going to talk to you about logistics, <laughs> um, but that is behind a lot of science, at least it's scale up. So as was said, along with a number of um, UK and international scientists in, in March, um, well, like many of us, I, I really started to think about how my technique, our technique could be useful for, for mass spectrometry um, in, in, in the era now of, of this pandemic. And Partly that was driven by the fact I had an awful lot of instruments that were sitting idle because of lockdown. Um, but of course, it also is driven by the fact that we know mass spectrometry is a fantastic detector for proteins and other biomolecules that are markers of, of disease. And so um, I'm going to talk to you today about work that we're doing in the UK, which is a very, very large scale programme to use mass spectrometry as a diagnostic testing platform. So first of all, on the coalition. Oh God, that's come really fast. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the coalition now is is um, more than seven hundred members um, in twenty eight countries. We have a website, and I advise you to go to it and sign up if you haven't. Um, there's many labs involved, and there's been a great buy-in in the UK, partly because we started it here, but but also because. There's a, a huge amount of mass spectrometry in the UK, both in um, academic and also clinical labs and of course represented by industry. We have a lot of support from industry for what we're doing all through this and I think that's clear from, from the talks we've seen and from this. Our website hosts an open data catalogue and working with European, um, you, sorry, with the EU data portal, we will connect to any data hubs. So our aim is to catalogue all the proteomic data. So I urge you, and I will be writing to some of you, to ask you to submit that data. And, and a lot of that is also driven by Costas Thalassimos at UCL. Um, last time I checked, if, if you do a search of, on COVID-19 and mass spectrometry, there were more than 200 papers and, and that was including on the archives. And I'm sure there's going to be many more to come. And, and we wrote a, a paper which everyone who's a member of the coalition is a signatory of, which was in the Lancet in, in May. So that sets out um, what mass spectrometry can do. And actually in that letter, we resisted talking very much about the use of mass spectrometry for diagnostic capabilities, partly because it had been so um, seemingly well covered by RT-PCR, but of course um, that's not the full picture as, as many of you will know. So there are many groups who have also considered the use of mass spectrometry for COVID-19 diagnostics and I, I name some of them here. Um, there was some early work from the group of Andrea Sintz um, where they took a gargle, a, a gargle solution and were able to identify spike proteins and also actually some, some antigens. Um, there's been great work, so that's that paper, Ilin et al. Uh, Ray Illes and others working at Mac Biosciences have done similar with Molditoff. Um, there's been fantastic work, um, which has not yet come out, um, but from my chair, um, who's done a brilliant round robin study looking at um, the use of mass spectrometry for diagnostics. And I, I understand that's going to be um, at least on a preprint server near you very soon. So many people have shown that actually, of course, we can detect the proteins that are part of the viral capsid. And this was enough to convince the National Health Service Test and Trace Innovation Team that they needed to consider it as one of the new testing strategies to increase our capability and also to consider a slump, somewhat different supply chain to that used for RT-PCR. So it's not to replace in any means, but it's to think about different routes to, to, to enable mass testing. 
So if we are to deploy mass spectrometry, um, and, and I and, and, and some other colleagues were called upon to, to think about this and to talk to government about this, we really need to think about how we're going to do that. And, and the first thing that I was aware of, and, and particularly through working with the coalition, was, was how many dedicated laboratories there are in the UK and how we could commandeer some of those to help in the scale up for, for testing this winter. I knew that that was going to require input from academic, industrial and NHS partners and that use of testing knowledge in using existing academic and, and hospital labs is indeed the sort of roadmap that's been taken in other countries for RT-PCR um, and it's in some respects what the Crick have done with their effort in, in pipeline testing. Um, and I think it has a lot going for it um, because academic and clinical leadership is really critical, I think, in, in getting these things right. We knew we needed to evaluate technology um, and I'm firmly convinced that that needs to be needs to involve regional public health um, and the technology to be employed should have some clinical utility beyond the time of this pandemic, um, which we all hope will at least diminish sometime in the next six months. We had a lot of discussion with industrial partners and some of them are here and there's many others that have been talked to. Um, and what our brief was to, to, to scale ourselves for mass testing in, in areas spread across the UK. So we set a challenge that we would be able to screen um, the population of the UK and detect the antigen from the virus and potentially also the antibody and something else and, and something else in our case is going to be winter flu virus so we're going to look to see whether we can also detect um, antigens from the winter flu um, in, in saliva and um, nasal pharyngeal swabs. As I mentioned the um, underlying um, belief from, from government is that we can use this for COVID and COVID diagnostics is absolutely what we're doing but that that repurpose that diagnostic capability could then be repurposed to help stratification. We've already seen excellent work showing how we can look at risk factors for COVID. There's also work looking at long COVID and the effects of that. And as we know, there are many, many other proven uses of mass spectrometry based proteomics and other omics for disease diagnostics and prognostics. So the short and long term health effects of COVID are one thing, but other things are there. And unfortunately, um, I guess we're all now aware we do need to think about infection X, um, which is what the WHO called COVID before we knew about it. So this collaborative effort is being set up li like this. We have university labs conducting analytical validation um, and we call these pilot labs. This is the P1. We then have hospital labs who are conducting a clinical validation and looking to get this to an ISO standard by Christmas. Um, that's an amazing effort. And then that methodology will be scaled up with industrial partners supporting um, our, our programme and, and allowing this to be really mass deployed. So the objections are, as I've said, population screening, but also to do the sort of work that we know mass spectrometry can do very well in terms of prognostic markers, risk management, and as we've said, look at long term population health and embed such capabilities in the UK to allow mass spectrometry to be used as it is used for newborn screening and of course for many, many other hospital based tests, but not whole scale for, for um, health screening. Uh, we think there's a chance to do that now. So this is the timeline. We've already started with the with the pilot labs, uh, the P1 labs, the analytical, uh, the university labs, and very soon we'll be doing the clinical validation um, at the NHS labs too. There is a proposed scale up in January um, through the NHS in, in every case. So the pilot labs have been given very simple briefs. <laughs> uh, they're based on target product, product profiles um, as designed by um, the MHRA. And the aim is to detect antigens and perhaps antibodies from, from the virus in, in people of all ages during any stage of active infection. And so we want to really target this both at people, of course, who are infected, but also people who are asymptomatic and don't have any clinical indicators of, of the infection. And as said, the target use setting is designated mass spectrometry laboratories. To be clear, we're not talking about point of use um, analysis, 
but, but of course point of use testing. So these are the phase one academic laboratories. Um, people in all of them are working extremely hard, fairly well geographically spread, um, and they've been given a brief to work on published methods, so methods that are already out there, and, and, and those came from, from those that I showed on the slide before. Uh, two of the labs in, are looking at, at um, Moldy, and, and the others all are looking at LCMS uh, methods. So um, this is just, these are actually pictures from today from, from, from the MIB, the Institute in which I, I research. And um, this is just to show you the kind of scale of the enterprise. Uh, one of the things we're doing, which is unusual or different um, in, in tests so far in the UK, is that the samples, once they've been swabbed or, or the saliva has gone into tubes, will go into a deactivation buffer. And, and we're using hand wash, 70% ethanol. We know it deactivates and Public Health England have approved that. And um, currently in the supply chain, there was no one who could do that for us. I did think very much about going to distilleries, but um, instead I went to my own my own institute and my own institute are currently hand pipetting and soon we will move to our robotics platforms to robotically pipette enough um, ethanol and buffer into tubes for us to be able to conduct 30,000 tests in the next three weeks. Um, so at the P1 level, we'll be getting about 250 sorry, 2,500 samples per lab, although we only need to run 150 to 250 uh, positive to negative, but we need that much to, to make sure that we've got the, the numbers of positives. There'll be a reference measurement from whatever diagnostic is being used in the hospitals, um, and there will be a gold standard um, comparator done by, by the Crick Institute um, with RT-PCR. The aims of the phase one labs are to establish limits of detection and limits of quantum standards in, in saliva and sputum. Um, and then to optimise established methods that's established in the last five months on, on LCMS and Moldy platforms. We have an aim for, for high throughput, so 12 samples per hour, with a eventual aim of, of getting um, up to 400, 500 samples per day on every mass spectrometer. And these pilot labs are also evaluating enrichment strategies and reference materials. The aim of these pilot labs is to then work very much in conjunction with hospital labs and to transfer at the end of uh, around about the beginning of December those methods to the pilot two laboratories in, in a kit and a kit including the, the components but also the, the data tools needed to run these methods in clinical in, in clinical laboratories. Um, here are the phase two clinical laboratories better geographical spread here. Um, and there are 20 of those and they're really fired up to do this. I have to say one of the, I don't know if you call it a COVID silver lining, but one of the things that's been so remarkable to me as, a, as an academic scientist who spent a lot of my career just sort of wanting to have Sweden bring my lab up, um, is how important it is we think about where science is really done. And I, and I think actually to some extent science is really done in, in these places. And I think I should spend more time and perhaps all of us should spend more time training people to work in, in these places. And so one of the great things about this um, process is that we are transferring methods rapidly from academic labs to clinical labs um, for, for good use. Show the time timeline again just because I have to remind myself on a bit because it's so fast um, and then um, just to thank um, there are many people involved this is a, a screenshot of the um, zoom meeting of the of the some of the p1 labs yesterday um, many people to thank um, from different labs there's Andy Pitt from from um, Mark Barber Center and Kevin Mills from UCL Ed Emmett from um, Liverpool just putting out the lab heads because I am Richard Unwin from the Stoller Centre, Paul Skip from Southampton, and there are a number of other, Rainer Kramer, maybe he'd left by then. There's a number of other um, PIs involved. NHS Test and Trace, I have to say, have been brilliant. Um, they really, really get this. They really want to do it. Um, great people in, in Ernst & Young who've helped to push a lot of the procurement, which has been big for this through. Um, Rick Body, who's a clinical lead, who's whose study, um, which is called Falcon or, or Condor, is allowing us to sample from people. It's got, we've got the ethical consent to do that. And um, various other people have helped a lot. And, I, and a special thanks goes to not just my team at um, the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology, but many other people who are really helping to get this going. Thank you. Happy to take any questions.
great. Thank you. That was really uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to hand over to Ian and he is going to chair the roundtable discussion. Um, and please remember questions on the Slack channel, please prefix them with the speaker um, and give any questions that you already see there a thumbs up if you would like to hear them answered. So it's over to you, Martin. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, this is uh, this has been uh, an amazing lineup and, uh, and, and a very nice uh overview of what proteomics is doing let me first off just score the little pass that uh, perdita just gave us uh, we are sharing uh, the manuscript of our essay uh, as a sneak preview here in the slack channel for those of you uh, interested in what triple quadruples might be doing in the very near future um and and if we look at it um we've seen basically proteomics working in diagnosis um helping to to do prognosis and um and even helping to look for a cure and it's it has gone very fast so i just wanted to kick off with a more uh retrospective question um what what um uh how well did this go this is it good to go fast and 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 what 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 went wrong by trying to go as fast as we can um i don't know if any of the speakers wants to go first on this. I think it, it holds for each of you. Uh... I can go, I think, uh, mm -hmm. yes. And so uh, I think, you know, the, of course, the, the benefits has been that you focus so much of the world's scientific capacity in a single single focus. And I think that's been amazing. And that's why it has allowed us to move as quickly as we can. In our example, I think we had, you know, amazing capacity to do quite a lot of research from microscopy to structural biology to you know infection assays to proteomics bioinformatics and you typically can't do that because in, in a sense you, you would have to ask somebody to take away from their own focus and sort of collaborate on this and that's been amazing i think there's been some of course the negative aspect is the peer reviewing i think has been shallower than than it typically is i think we can all agree to that and it's also that you have a lot of research that's being posted on bioarchive, which is I fully support. But, you know, my group is a bioinformatics group and we would be the type of group that should be collating all these efforts, reanalyzing and making sense of all this information. And you just can't cope. It's, it's really impossible at this stage. So we, we would need, you know, a full year of dedicated effort to try to put these efforts, these different uh, data together and try to make sense of why, why do things overlap or not and all these different things. So it's really a pace of research that on hand it has to be like this because we we want to make an effort that could still inform clinical decisions but on the other hand it's just scientifically not the most sound and that has of course the drawbacks anybody wants to add to this yeah i mean i i think this is what science is all about i think we've seen so many i mean we're talking about the ones in respiratory we've seen so many collaborations happening. I mean, Martin, you, you yourself have been absolutely um, leading one. And I think um, I think that's why we're here. I mean, for me, you know, all of us have gone through many um, uh, thoughts over the last few months, right? I mean, you really have considered what, what, what are we doing here and why are we doing here? But I think for me, at least, I, I, I felt well. If I'm here and I know how to analyze molecules, I'm doing well better get on with it. Um, and I think a lot of people I know have been really driven to do that and to do useful things rather than just trying to do, you know, something a little bit better than someone else. Um, so it's my view. <laughs> I, th I think that there have been uh, lots of super cool papers published since, since, the, since the start of the pandemic on coronavirus and in very different areas. And uh, also, this led to development of technologies which can be used later with different kinds of diseases, completely novel because no one's did, no one's done it before. And now, at least we we do know we have lots of information how to approach any such situation if it occurs in the future. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's that's also very much what we and it's kind of amazing the UK government really are getting that from us. I mean, I think the fact that we can now be prepared for disease because disease hasn't gone away you know the regular disease has not gone away so we can be prepared in a more collaborative way for it 
and as I said, for training people for it, but also we can be prepared for the next pandemic because there will be one. Yeah, I uh, I totally agree. I think many lessons learned, and and we might be even faster next time without without all the uh, the disadvantages. Um, so maybe let's go into a few more technical questions because those are the main ones coming in in the in the in the Slack. Um, Vadim, to you first. Uh, it's a recurring question that um, people in intensive care seem to be um, on, on some kind of serum dilution. I'm not a doctor, so I was not aware, uh, but I can imagine how that can impact um, results uh, severely. And I think it might relate. And so I'll, I'll, I'll just add that to the question to the, the famous cytokine storm that, that has been known. These are two very, um, very invasive changes in the plasma. Um, how do you either normalize or, or, or handle these or is, is are you just are, are you additionally confirming these these phenomena? Yeah, so we do normalize our data. So we don't uh, when, when we're when we're processing the samples, we just take a plasma sample and the amount of protein which is in there. This is the amount which goes into the mass pack, so we don't change it. But we do normalize the data in silico when we're processing it. And uh, this is quite a sophisticated algorithm, which basically similar to what would happen if you took median protein quantities, because different samples are made them the same. So it is normalized. It should correct for these kind of effects. Not fully, of course, but partially. Uh, about cytokine storm. Uh, so yes, it's uh, we, we do see lots of cytokine activation and signatures of cytokine activation. And of course, interleukin-6 and everything associated with it goes up in severe coronavirus. Uh, it goes down during the progression of disease for most patients. Uh, I've seen papers which uh, which actually say that uh, maybe we shouldn't call it cytokine storm because uh, it's not as severe uh, if you just measure the, the levels of the markers in comparison to previously observed different kinds of uh, acute respiratory syndrome. So, uh, but 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 what we do see a signature, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, this one this one uh, goes out to to Pedro since it was asked uh, twice as well. People are very fascinated uh, about the filipodia you were showing. I myself included. Uh, I know that's not your uh, part of the uh, of the research, but do you know of anybody pursuing these and and on what cells were these exactly uh, shown on this image? Yeah, so these are CAGO2, the ones that it, those compared to macro mark infections show a very pronounced increase in filipodia when you infect with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Filipodia formation or these surface extensions have been shown for other viruses like the Marburg viruses as, as an example. The why this happens is not clear. Uh, the how is also still not clear. So the current hypothesis is that um, N protein interacts with kinase 2 kinase kinase 2 is strongly activated. If you overexpress N alone, you can see that there is an increased phosphorylation of the targets of casein kinase 2. Uh, so we, we, we think N causes the activation of casein kinase 2, and casein kinase 2 causes the increase in filopodia, but this, this has not been shown. So the activation of casein, two, casein kinase 2 leading to infection of has not been shown, but that's, a, that's the hypothesis. The Y is potentially twofold. One is that it could inv help invade nearby cells or it could also help just in the budding and by that it would increase proliferation probabilities but you know, again these are these are not as we no, nobody in our research teams meaning this consortium is currently following this up it is it is fascinating how we are being manipulated by such a small organism in such a advanced way um, and, and maybe just a follow up question is is have you learned anything about what the, the best current in vitro models are for drug development or, or which ones to avoid? No, I mean, what, what I can definitely say is that there is not enough examples of going through the whole process of taking a drug through all the models. Let's say you have a cell based model and then say an animal model like a ferret and then clinical trials. So ideally, you'd have several drugs and then you'd be able to understand a bit better why some go through and some don't. And I'm sure this, you know, somebody in the drug development pharma companies would, would be a much better position to give you a better answer to this. It, I think if you just compare the different 
in vitro studies that have been done with drugs and cells, they don't compare favorably again. So, so there's been several of these studies looking at hundreds of drugs, and the overlaps are quite small. And that that is already quite worrying, right? That there is already technical variability there. That's already hard to understand. Thank you. Um, uh, I see a lot of questions also um, heading Perdida's way. Um, and uh, one that I'm also very fascinated about this is uh, the potential of mass spec to uh, maybe as one of the few fields easily start including other pathogens uh, while we're at it. That's not a big issue. You mentioned including flu, but it's a just remark that we might not be able to study this as easy as we want just because of Corona uh, and lockdown and a, and, a, and a limited spread if that is what the question was intending. So will we have enough flu uh, this winter to see if, if you can include it? Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, listen, we have a brief which is, which is quite common in, in get, trying to get any test through accreditation, which is to have a, uh, a, a, compar a reference standard to compare it with. And of course, we all might say, well, that will be the mass of the peptides or their sequence, which mass spectrometry tells us, but that's a, that's an internal view. So we are using the 2020 flu antigens as a reference standard or for specificity, right? So, so we're using them for that. If we find them, we find them and that would be a bonus, but we can demonstrate that that's something we can do. Currently, what we're actually really, really interested in is whether we might be able to determine the peptides in the spike that are in the mutated mink strain from Denmark. And so that is uh, certainly on, on, on the radar. Um, so I think that, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, I, I read it was too fast. It was too late at night, but I read something about indeed the new the new outbreak. Um, so you think it's mass spec is, is, is will be able to be one of the first to maybe look at it we're looking at whether those peptides are commonly seen in the spike their spike i mean it's, it's in the spike rates in the spike region it's quite high up in the spike region so i'm not sure but we're looking to see if we find them and then that would be possible i don't yeah i don't oh god i hope it won't be in, in any of the samples we're studying from from uk but you never know um but it's more about whether we can and that would then make a very good use case uh, you know when you're i mean i'm sure everyone realizes this when you're dealing with politicians you really need to make very simple use cases and the the flu or coronavirus was a very good use case to make and i think it's important if you also are dealing with a child with a snotty nose to make that youth use case um so there are yeah so there are advantages thinking like that um, another issue still addressing you is is um, is whether uh, you think uh, enrichment is is going to be a crucial part, and if it is, if that will that not be a very big hurdle for clinics to overcome? So at the moment we're trying to make as minimal a method as possible, um, but we are considering enrichment. As I've said, one of the ways I think we may uh, use enrichment or a possible way would be to do it in the kit, in the sampling kit. So let's see if the people can get that sort of thing to work. Um, so we want to minimize the steps and, and absolutely it is right. If we're gonna take this into clinical laboratories, they want it to be something that can be handled by you know, a, a technical grade routine analyst. And that's actually, that's actually a really great scientific challenge to try and get something to work like that. I, I think we can, that's why we've got so many people working on it, but we'll see. And maybe a last one on that is, and, and I don't want to put you in this place actually, but it's there we have again uh, uh, the alternative uh, being Maldi also being suggested, which has been uh, proven to be very efficient for uh, biotyper like applications for finding prokaryotes at least. It would be, I think, the first time they're trying to, to use it to detect viruses. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so two, as I said, two of the labs are Peter Connor in Warwick and Raina Kramer in, in Reading are absolutely evaluating Maldi. They're doing that. I, I have to say, and there's another question about this too, you really have to think about end to end. So we are talking about something that is for mass scale up, which is very, very different to what anyone has done before. I, I admit, of course, the biotypers are doing this for 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 bacterial strains and that that's fine but this is 
but that is from clinical samples, that's from clinical isolates. So we are talking about mass testing. It's just like a scale beyond that kind of thing. So I'm sorry, that's not to say anything about, about Maldi. Maldi could be a fantastic method of doing this, but the considerations are less about the mass spectrometry and more about how we can sample from people and how we can get those samples from people to labs and how we can process the samples and get them onto the mass spectrometry. The mass spectrometry part is, is, is quite simple. Um, so sorry, I mean, you know, I, I, it's not. So I think um, everyone should think about that part of things. It's, it's yeah, really yeah. about the ease of, of, of applying the test and transferring the material. This is exactly where I, I wanted to uh to go next, uh, this time with Vadim, it's now we're thinking about where is this leading? Uh, so everybody has done the, the easy part, the mass spec part. Uh, <laughs> um, now, also in the clinic, if you if you then uh, manage to to have this uh, almost five weeks heads uh, heads up on, on, on the outcome, um, are you aware of any uh, targeted um, uh, di um, treatments that are being developed based on, on what you're seeing? So uh, I'm not aware personally of anything based on things like that. But ultimately, of course, the purpose is to, to find biomarkers which are able to tell, OK, this patient is low risk, this patient is high risk, and adjust treatment decisions based on that. And that, that's, that's what we hope will eventually how it will work. And we try to basically characterize every single protein we detect, uh, every single clinical lab measurement in terms of how it's characteristic of severity and how predictive it is. So two things. And it's, it's just striking that some of them are very characteristic, but are not predictive at all. One example is protein gelsolin that goes down in severe coronavirus. It doesn't seem to be predictive. Some things are very predictive on the other hand. And uh, this, this, for example, allows us to tell, OK, these are routine clinical markers that are measured already. You don't need to establish any separate assays for them. You just, you just know which of them to look at, which are really predictive, which are just characterizing what has been happening with the patient in the past. Mm -hmm. Because as a follow up question, um, what you guys have been doing was uh, uh, still an academic effort, at least as I feel it. Um, uh, how how realistic would it be to have these high resolution instruments, these triple tops, installed in in a, in a hospital for diagnostic reasons? Do you see this actually happening? And especially then the coupling with all the other clinical parameters, the 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 the, the machine learning software. These are pretty pretty dense dense things. Is that is, is it feasible? You think? Uh I don't really think it's feasible. So it's a bit of a delicate instrument, which uh, it, it's not something which you would routinely use in the clinic. And I think it's not really necessary because what it's it's an ideal instrument for diagnose for for discovery purposes. When you when you take a cord with a disease and you want to find out what's happening, you want to find biomarkers. This is ideally how how you would do that, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, but to streamline this into clinic. Uh, probably it just makes sense to use triple quotes for that, which are there already. And uh, it's not like it's not even for prediction. It's possible to identify a limit peptides which will be predictive, and this can be easily measured with a triple quote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and, and then I wanted to move to, to Pedro um, uh, because. I have heard people uh, asking when I say that I, I work with a mass spec and I try to do something uh, uh, sensible in this pandemic with the instrument, uh, they always ask me, are you making a vaccine? Uh, because that's apparently the most sensible thing you want to be doing. I, I was wondering, is there any uh, mass spec, is there any place for mass specs in vaccine development? So we we really um, sorry. Oh, do you want? To, so 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 I think um, one of the areas, and 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 then this is in in a way um, what Pedro talked about is is in HDX mass spectrometry to try and map the um, interactions and particularly with mutated forms and to to it to to map those dynamics around the interactions. 
Um, and I know Western Strew and, and others have been working in, in that area. And indeed, it's something in, in our own lab we'd quite like to get onto. So I think that's one of the areas it, it can help. But clearly, it can also help in, in determining um, the host response, right, following vaccination. And I guess that will be an interesting thing to do, particularly particularly in the in the um, the trials where people are going to be infected. Peter, do you have anything to add to this? No, not really. I mean, you you always have to compare with other potential technologies. And again, I'm pretty a bit less focused on MS than more people here, although we primarily work with proteomics data sets. But you know, it always has to be a, a balance between what's possible to measure and you know, ease of cost and all these other things. So I think from the vaccine perspective, I don't see anything very obvious the most obvious things would not be. I mean, one for me more clearly has been other applications of mass spec. And I think proteomics and mass spectrometry should be seen as having an excellent response to the pandemic. If you look at the other technologies and the other data sets and the other types of data that come out, they haven't been as useful in any ways, actually. And I can say that would maybe not as biased view as maybe other members of, of this <laughs> community. <laughs> And, and so, you know, on par with structural biology, I think structural biology and, and proteomics, mass spectrometry have been, you know, incredible in coming up with uh, quite practical advances, I think. And can I then ask the follow up question? Uh, we have always been last in class up until now. What uh, is changing? Is it the machine learning or uh, and the instrumentation is probably both, but what the machine learning seems to be the big thing here, uh, especially I in, in, in in your fields, no? Uh, so I think that's one of it. I think it's also that there's been huge efforts through Hoopo, through Miami, through Mirage to get our data standards sorted, right? We really, uh, even in, in my home area, our mobility must be we've really worked on this. We've really, really worked on, on, on that standardized data. Now, of course, that helps with the machine learning, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and, and we must also thank the manufacturers for making such brilliant, incredibly sensitive instruments um, and, and working with many of us to do that. So I think so. So to me, I think it's that the those collaborations had already been set up and it was because of the the bad old world of, of you know, single peptides, meaning proteins um, that, that that have driven that. So so our need to have validation has 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 been put us in the right place at the right time, I think. Anybody wants to add something to this, Pedro? I think you were Sorry, I, I don't think it has to do with, I mean, the no capacity to analyze the data has changed, but it, it, that doesn't make a difference. I think a, a lot of what was done could have been done five years ago, maybe not as, you know, not as sensitive readouts, but but the, the types of, of analysis that have been done that generate quite a lot of advances are not the, necessarily the most cutting edge stuff that's been currently done in, in mass spectrometry. It, it's really just that these are practical, useful ways of understanding cell biology and how it changes, which suggest drug targets. Uh, and in fact, the, the single cell sequencing or these types of approaches are not very good at doing that. They're, they're, they've been good at understanding the immune response, for example, but that's uh, which is something that's been done better at single cell level. But really just that these things are very good at understanding the biochemistry and the cell biology, and that's what gets you the targets. Vadim, you want to add something to this? Yeah, so so I, I think it's it's quite clear now that machine learning gives better predictive power than looking at individual biomarkers. And there's been multiple studies demonstrating this uh, in, in other areas and in coronavirus research recently. So I, I think it's, it's just very important to try to standardize these methods because the main challenge is, is translation. So if you train your machine learning model on one data set, one cohort, can you translate it into use on, the, on on a different one? And this is not particularly straightforward. So, so I think it's very important to develop methods to to standardize this and to streamline the, this into clinical practice. Uh, let me grab this final this this last remark of yours to go back to the the, the diagnosis and and to Berdita. Um, uh, because, like you mentioned, uh, switching between platforms, MassPec is, is is struggling above all with the fact that every instrument and every platform is different, uh, much more so than than for qPCR, I think. Um, um, 
we are also struggling to figure out where we need to land if we if we compare to the golden standard now. Uh, people mention fixed CT values. They want to like reach in their in their assay. Uh, there's a fixation nearly on on how many variants you can you can you can detect. How how do we handle these kind of uh, issues. Do we want to reach the threshold or do we look for other ways to show that we're of value? So I think the breadth of analysis and mass spectrometry is its strength as well as its opportunity to be repurposed. But for, to my mind at least, I don't have any desire nor do, definitely do government to have a monopoly supplier uh, for any solution. And another way of putting that is what I tell my first year PhD students, which is never be on the edge of tuning space, right? None of us, and that for a clinical lab is just normal. You, you, none of us want an assay that is so sensitive either to, you know, uh, uh, maybe how the sample was collected or how it was transported that it doesn't, that it, that it doesn't, that it's not robust. Um, in terms of referencing, we will reference, we for this study, as I mentioned, will reference from a single site RT-PCR and then we will know something um, at a large number of samples with CT values. What is interesting, as I'm sure you know, is that many, many hospitals are now using a, quite a wide range of diagnostic tests which have very different sensitivity and specificity. So we will, as a kind of, um, <laughs> by the way, be also assaying that against mass spectrometry. Um, and I think finally, we will have standard reference peptides or something that we will compare against. So there will be a quantitative assay that will be internal. And, and, and as you know, that's that's one of our strengths. <laughs> and, and, and maybe one, uh, one, one follow up here also. Another thing is, and, and this holds to all the, this is actually, for all testing available, everything out there is 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 kind of the struggle uh, to find true negative people. So most swaps up until now were taken in a hospital or by people that have a kind of symptom. Um, swapping uh, uh, or knowing somebody's healthy is is hard enough to begin with. Um, so how how do we handle this in, when we try? maybe even at one point tries machine learning to distinguish populations of healthy and diseased on any kind of data we have. But um, so uh, how do we know that that somebody's healthy and how can we handle this um, this issue? Anybody? <laughs> I, I think it's annoying because we have some kind of signal everywhere and we wonder is this signal coming from 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 what we hope it comes or is this so, okay so, so my view on this is that everyone 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 across the world is getting very used to being tested now right um so there is perhaps a role to say that we could start to implement a population screen to determine how our population is there are huge data and ethical implications in doing that which a lot of which, and we haven't touched on this, but a lot of that has been very fast tracked and there's been brilliant efforts by all of those regulatory authorities, but we worry a little bit about that kind of thing. Um, uh, maybe less in the UK than, than other places, but we still worry about it. So I think we best think a little bit about what we want <laughs> from such a thing. But clearly for an infectious disease like, like coronavirus, people will know, so that, uh, that goes above any other concerns, mostly. It, it, it does raise a final, uh, at least a final question before I start wrapping up, and this one goes out to Pedro. It's it's again about the data and, uh, and GDPR-like issues, um, uh, but maybe more uh, in, in terms of how we could share data between people that are working on the same things. Um, uh, is it is is this accelerating what we were already trying within the field? Uh, is there things that need to be addressed uh, instantly, like metadata and 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 how, or is there alternative ways maybe to share data in a way that people can attain the metadata that they need in a, in another way than just the public repository? How how is this evolving? Right, and so I'm also a computer at the European Bioinformatics Institute, which has contributed quite a lot to the COVID-19 data portal 
And of course, really the best way that people can share that is through standard repositories, you know, for proteomics, proteomics exchange uh, repositories would be the thing to, to go. And for many of these types of data sets, there will be repositories by which you can share data. I think the proteomics community around the health privacy, uh, patient records privacy issues has not yet uh, got his, the heads around that issue and how to deal with privacy and to what extent mass spectrometry that it carries information that can be used to identify an individual is something that it has not been completely covered and discussed. And if, of course, ideally for people like myself who would like to use data sets, ideally we, we don't need to protect these data, but there are mechanisms to do this. This has been done now for many years for the genomics data sets as well. So there are mechanisms to do it in a federated way, even if we need to, such that the data can stay within each country. It doesn't have to leave the borders of that country, but we still we still have ways of accessing that information. And so, you know, what I say is definitely share the data through the standard repositories if there one exists, and all of these are now being put through to the COVID data portal. So I think there there are mechanisms to share data reasonably well. Honestly, for this particular current crisis, my the biggest limitations now are actually making sense of the data, because it's being produced at a rate that there there's just, it, there aren't labs that do the analysis uh, properly to be able to go through all these different data sets. I think that's that's the current limitation at the moment. Okay, um, so I, I've kind of tried throughout the discussion to incorporate the questions. Uh, some of these, uh, well, most I, I have not literally phrased. I hope everybody kind of found his answers, uh, her answers still. Um, I wanted to wrap up um, with with you three uh, each in, in order of of the way you spoke. What the most important lesson is you've learned uh, in the past uh, couple of months. Uh, so, uh, Vadim, you were first. Is there anything that that really changed for you? In my research, or in general, about what what, what was happening? You, can, you have a pick. <laughs> yes. Yes. And what was happening is that yeah. We know now many more things than we used to know, and uh, we know how to approach such things. And yeah, ho hopefully it's gonna get better in terms of how how effectively we work on this. Uh, Pedro, yeah, I mean for uh, for me in particular, it's been a, a wild ride. I think you know it's been doing science at science fiction speed. Really, if you <laughs> if you've seen some of those movies portraying uh, you know how science can be done in, in movies, and you think, oh, this is absolutely ridiculous. This could never happen. But in fact, in, in the last months, science has moved at a pace that's quite unbelievable. And in being through that process, you know, it, it really feels amazingly powerful. And I I would just wish that in my normal research we could do the same amount of research in in a few months. I mean, the, the fossil proteomics project took three months, you know, from start to finish to do. And that, that's just unbelievable because it, it would take three years usually or something like that. And so that's just completely unbelievable. The other thing for me is really just that at the end of this, I think we're going to look back and say how amazing that scientists have done. And also the medical community is absolutely incredible. And, and that's something that we should all at the end look back and say, We've done a good job. I feel that that it'd be harder to do something better. We'll uh, yeah. we'll ask that question if we're finally laying down in our sofas and uh, <laughs> and trying to figure out what just happened. Uh, uh, Perdita, you? Oh gosh, I agree with what's been said by by the others, and and I, I you know it is a time to be alive, and it is a time to be a, a measurement scientist, um, and. I think it's great that we can work together. There, are, all of us have had other reasons for thinking about why um, we should work together. There was a, a great scientist called A.V. Hill who won the Nobel Prize for Physiology in, in, in the 1920s. And he said that for true science to, to be, the best science to be done, it, there must be true internationalization. Um, and he, he wrote that um, in 1932. And you can imagine why he was writing that then. And I think, now it's the same. We we need to work internationally and together and share rather than compete. Um, and it's a you know it's a very bad reason to have to do it, but but it's great that we can and we should keep doing it. I want to yeah really uh, uh, line up with what you just said, and I'm and I'm really surprised and 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 amazed by uh, how open uh, people have been in the few 
last months, especially over the academia and industry borders, uh, companies helping out, uh, no longer hiding anything, just trying to get this to work. Um, I'm actually very proud to be part of this uh, endeavor. Um, and with this, I want to um, hand over uh, to uh, Maike from um, the YPIC, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, which is an amazing organization, by the way. Um, and they have uh, this, this very nice uh, uh, mini challenge that they had going, and I'll leave the floor to, her, to Maike to explain what it looked like and who won. Uh, yeah, I hope you can see the slide because I can't see it on there. But um, thank you very much for uh, having us. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for the great presentations. And uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Matrix Science for sponsoring the challenge that I'm going to present now. So if you have been on the other uh, webinars, you know that we did the, that this is already the third challenge and it consisted of the spectra that you see on the slide. Um, those actually come from the same organism uh, fitting. Both are uh, from uh, COVID-19, uh, from COVID. Um, and I will show you the results now. So if you match the YMB iron series that you can see on the spectra now in uh, red and blue, you were able to identify the, um, the peptide sequence that is listed um, with the one on top belonging to um, SARS-CoV-2 um, and the one below is from uh, SARS-CoV-2. So the difference was the um, mutation that is at D614 to G it's marked by the asterisk in the top one, which is linked to uh, the infectiveness uh, in the COVID-19. Um, you have to factor in the um, cis carbamylum methylation if you um, want to solve the series. And um, as always, we got a lot of uh, correct answers. And as you might know, we have two winners for all the challenges. So the first winner is the fastest entry and then there's a random winner. The uh, fastest answer for this time was by um, Bharat uh, Kumaragutaman, who's working at the Max Planck Institute in Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics. And he figured out the uh, correct answer in 32 minutes, which is great. And uh, with that, he won uh, one of the uh, 10 pound Amazon vouchers. And then there's the um, random winner for this time is uh, Daniel Rotenberg from BioNTech in the US. He gets the second uh, Amazon voucher. So the next um, challenge will be out for the next LPDG webinar on the 4th of December. So uh, make sure you look at all the information that is going out for there on all the challenge from uh, channels from IPIC and uh, LPDG. And uh, especially save all the answers that you got because at the end there's a big uh, combined challenge where you can win a bigger voucher. So thanks to uh, LPDG, the speakers, and again, Matrix Science <laughs> for having the challenge with us. And uh, good luck to uh, everyone for the next and the big challenge. Great. Uh, thanks, Micah. Um, and uh, congratulations to the winners. So I just wrap up here. As mentioned earlier, we will have a form for those requiring certificates of attendance, which will be accessible for a few minutes uh, just after we wrap up. I'd like to say a really big thank you to all of our speakers, our guest chair, 
and Micah from YPIC and Matrix Science for sponsoring today's challenge and to everyone who joined uh, and to our sponsors and those committee members who are working away in the background to make this webinar possible. As Micah mentioned, don't forget to join us again now in four weeks time on the 4th of December for our final webinar of 